Well, welcome everybody to our third part of Information Security Essentials for Small Businesses. We're joined by Matt Leathers, a cybersecurity consultant, and Meredith Carroll of Vertical Six. And today, in part three, they're going to talk about partners and all the people who can support you in ensuring your cybersecurity. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to them. Thank you so much. Thanks, Avi. Thanks, Avi. We appreciate it. And uh, we've enjoyed the series, and I hope that uh, everybody out there has also uh, thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, so let me share my screen and share the presentation. And we will get started. So as we bring up the presentation, um, I'm just going to do a quick recap for where we've been. Monday, we focused on phishing. Um, you know, it was a very narrow focus for our first session, but because phishing represents about over 90% of the risk to every organization, uh, we, spent, we spent the entire time talking about what phishing is um, and what protections you can take to, um, to avoid the bad fish um, getting into your environment. Um, and then session two, we talked about some of the tools that are available to protect your environment, you know, not only from phishing, although all of them were, were helpful in, a, in the event of phishing, but from any kind of a risk that comes into your environment. And, you know, we, we really focused on uh, backup as the number one um, protection that you can take against um, a security breach. And you'll see again today that we're going to kick off with backup because it is the most important. Um, so we talked about a, a tool, set of tools that you can consider. Uh, to protect your environment. And then today we're going to talk about um, leveraging the village, right? So, uh, so we're not, you're not alone out there. There's lots of um, ways you can get help and assistance and making sure that your business has the right tools to protect it. Yeah, I, I think that that's the key point here, Meredith, is, is that uh, generally speaking overall, you know, when, when you think about security, especially as a small business, you can kind of get overwhelmed. Um, and I think we touched on this earlier in the week. Plenty of us have attended these events that talk about security and you just walk out scared to death and wondering if there's anything that you can do. Um, and when we, as we close today, our focus and our emphasis is going to be on that fact that you're not alone um, and that there are resources that are businesses that do this for a living, but there are also um, entities like Venture Cafe that are actively advocating and supporting entrepreneurs and small businesses um, through a variety of topics, but cybersecurity um, and your security is one of those things. So, you know, to Matt's point, our goal is not um, to scare you. It's, it's information so that you can make the balanced decisions for your business, balancing security cost for sure um, and, and usability and productivity. So, you know, this is about taking a step back from the fear and thinking about what the right steps are. Yeah, I, I think we don't look very scary, Meredith. I think we look uh, pretty, pretty trustworthy. And, and we smile. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's not all gloom and doom. Um, and yeah, but for, so to, to just briefly introduce us, we are, we are experienced in this space. We not only have um, been uh, advising companies, but we have also worked for small businesses. Uh, we have been a part of small businesses um, as full-time employees. So we, we know what it's like, we know what the pressures are. And the pressures and the headlines uh, seem to be relentless. Um, so, you know, we do need to acknowledge the fact that this is a topic that is in the headlines on a fairly regular basis. Um, in the midst of the COVID crisis, I'm sure people have seen uh, the fact that um, the headlines came out that Zoom was breached and there were incidents where um, unsavory content was on Zoom meetings and should you use Zoom and um, if you think about it, there's a lot of noise out there um, that creates that fear, uncertainty and doubt. And if we kind of focus back and pull back on the signal, um, we start to understand why this is important um, and then how to how to really secure your business and secure yourself um, through various changes, various events, whether it's a pandemic or uh, whether it's an Equifax breach or something like that. And the key here is, is to remind you as a small business owner or a entrepreneur is that security from the outset um, is important. So on the left-hand side, you have the, the big companies like Walmart and Target and the headlines but the fact of the matter is, in both of those cases, there are widely reported breaches. Um, 
particularly with the target breach where they had actually hacked the point of sale cash registers and devices. Um, that started with a breach where a um, heating and air conditioning vendor um, had access and, and passwords to targets technology systems. And so the small, this is this poor small Pennsylvania based uh, HVAC vendor um, is ultimately the point of entry for the larger target breach. Um, but they're not in the headlines target is, but that more than likely negatively affected um, their ability to do business with target. But on the right hand side, as we kind of shift to there, the fact that there is hope here, and this is not something you're alone on, there's a lot of information out there. Um, there's a lot of help out there for small businesses and entrepreneurs. And here we, we kind of recap what we covered on Wednesday, where if you, if you take all that information out there, all that advice out there, we're really starting to get down at the brass tacks of what can you do right now? Um, what can you start thinking about? What solutions and tools can you select and use to help you really um, solve for this, this security challenge, not just as a one-time event, but on an ongoing basis? So that security is part of your brand, security is part of your business. And yeah, you keep it updated and you stay current, um, but it's something that is not scary for you. It's just a part of doing business. And it's a, it's a part of your business that you can feel comfortable and, and secure about instead of giving you a lot of anxiety. And so in, in terms of this checklist, um, today we're focusing not necessarily on the checklist themselves and the solutions, but the fact of the matter is you are, are going to reach a point um, where you kind of outgrow maybe some of the tools or some of the um, service providers or even some of the people that you might be using today. Um, you know, it, as an example, there was a client we we're working with um, and it was a supply company and they did about $20 million a year in business. That's a pretty healthy business. Um, and they were going to go through a rebranding exercise because they just bought another company. Um, and when it came down to it, they wanted to hire a friend of a friend to do their rebranding exercise and everything from their website to the logo um, and the rebrand. Um, we advised them not to, but they did it anyways. And frankly, um, they ended up copying the logo and they copied the, the font and everything from a uh, healthcare company with the exact same name. Um, so that rebranding exercise uh, did not go particularly well. And frankly, they had just sent, they had outgrown um, the people and the resources they had had up to that point. And so you have to decide what's right for you and where that tipping point is where um, it's okay to ask a family member for IT help or support, but there's gonna be a point where you probably outgrow that and your business and the um, survival of your business is gonna depend on upgrading the, the people around you as well as the solutions and service providers and tools around you. And there's a variety of, and we'll talk about specific resources throughout the course of this presentation, but there's a variety of different places where you can get expert advice. Um, and you know, I, I would even say that if you're applying for cyber liability insurance, just the process of answering those questions on the application is an education. Um, you know, I'm frequently pulled in with our clients to help answer those questions, um, which may or may not be straightforward depending on the application. Um, but you find out a lot about what you might not have when you when you answer those those questions. You know, for sure you don't have to answer every question yes, um, but uh, it, it will definitely tell you where some of your gaps might be just to go just to go through that process without without going through a full audit. Um, that application might help. Mm -hmm. Right, that, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so you know, <laughs> particularly today with COVID-19, um, we, we're all experiencing our alone together universe. Um, so, you know, our, our point here is that there's lots of resources out there. Um, there's gonna be some places you wouldn't have thought of, of asking. So, for, you know, we'll talk later again about cyber, li cyber liability insurance policies, but also your bank. Uh, your payroll processor. There's lots of resources out there, lots of opinions that you can you can gather from folks to to make the right decision for your business. Um, but you know, it, it's a little trite about it takes a village. Um, but when we're dealing with complex systems, we absolutely want to get get perspective from a number of different sources 
uh, to make an informed decision for what's right for your business. But there's lots of supports out there. You know, right. there's, some, there's some that are free, there's some that are gonna have costs associated with them, but there's lots of supports out there to make good decisions. Yeah, and fundamentally, you are good at your business and running your business, and let's let you focus on that. Uh, that's, that's what these resources are supposed to be doing, is letting you focus on uh, doing the parts of your business that you thrive at and are good at and enjoy, as opposed to uh, figuring out how to write content for security training. <laughs> You know, it, we as a as Vertical Six, um, we don't go out and find our own health insurance, right? That's not something that we're very skilled at. It's not it's not our core business. Um, so that is something that we we choose to outsource to another organization, as many organizations do. Um, but you know, you really want to spend your time focusing on your areas of expertise, and then find the right people to help you focus on the areas that aren't in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning that we, we started with backup in, um, in actually session one when we talked about defenses, session two we talked about a checklist of tools, and here we are in session three focusing on backup again, um, because backup really is that first line of defense. Uh, we talked in session two, Matt talked a lot about RPO and RTO. So RPO is how much data can you afford to lose in the event of a disaster? And RTO is how quickly do you need to be back online and functional? Um, those, the answers to those questions will drive the way that you do your backups and where you store them. Um, so, you know, as with most tools, there's a variety of, um, of options out there in the market. Each of them have their own pros and cons. Um, you know, we have our, our consumer grade options like your iCloud or using a physical USB drive. Um, those are very inexpensive for a lot of data storage. Um, so, you know, iCloud, you have, you have some data that's bundled in with your existing, um, with your account um, and USB drive, you know, you can get a multi terabyte USB drive for under, under a couple hundred dollars. Um, you know, so cost is definitely a pro for those consumer grade options. Um, you know, I, I would caution businesses because those are really geared towards individuals uh, and don't have a whole lot of resiliency built into them. Um, so going down a little bit of an art path when I, when I look at backup um, and I look at somebody using a USB drive, it's typically a single drive backup. If that single drive fails, there's not another copy of it. Um, this, this enterprise or, or business grade solutions are gonna have multiple drives that have redundancy also built into them. So, um, you know, I would definitely get some advice on, uh, on what backup solutions you're picking, especially if you're gonna do something more manual, uh, like a USB drive. On the business side, um, you know, certainly there are companies out there that are focused on providing backup solutions. So I'm, I'm sure most people have heard of Carbonite as a cloud-based backup provider. Um, you know, companies such as Vertical 6 managed services providers also have some more enterprise level backup solutions that can automate the backup process and also give us alerts on when those backups fail. Um, so, you know, the automation is key because it means that that data is getting backed up without anybody having to intervene. So it, does, it gets backed up regardless of, of vacations or sick time or forgetfulness. Um, and they're, they're very appropriate for, for business operations. Um, you know, the con is they're more expensive. So typically you're having to make some investment in hardware and, and storage um, offsite from, from your business. Yeah, I think part of the key things here too is that um, in terms of the advantages of using a business option versus a consumer grade option is um, Meredith pointed it out, forgetfulness. Um, it's just, it's not a priority for um, a lot of us, um, you know, uh, to, to, update and to uh, resave the backup um, on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. The drive just sits in a drawer and don't really pay attention to it. Um, as opposed to a business option where that is, that's a focus, that's something that is uh, uh, at the top of their priority list. Yeah, and we're human, so mistakes happen. So the, the higher degree of automation we can have, um, the more secure that data is gonna be. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, kind of carrying on that, um, people are human um, and people make mistakes. And the reality is that technology needs people and people need technology in order to work, to be successful. And so as we are thinking about security, 
talking with your employees and um, this, these policies and procedures are really where we kind of um, engage with our um, employees and really think about how we want to run our business and aligning people and technology. First of all, is, is that ongoing communication and dialogue. Um, so for example, acceptable use policies, we talked about those really in the week. Um, how are we as a business, what, what's okay um, with, uh, in, in terms of how we use computers, how we use phones, how we use devices, um, what's acceptable use and what's not. And let's define that and let's put that into a policy so that we as a, the current employees of the company are agreed and understand uh, what's okay and what's not okay. Whether that's uh, Fortnite on a computer machine or on a business computer or uh, that's Facebook. Um, you know, there may be different rules for different staff, but um, nail that down and document it uh, and agree to it so that you're all on the same page. And then as new employees come on or as employees leave, you have a very clear touchstone for what's expected of everybody. Um, no weak links, uh, making sure that um, as employee uh, populations, as, as the team changes, as it grows, ideally, um, let's say you go from two employees to 10 to 20, um, consistency and an ongoing dialogue are important. So making sure as you grow and as you hire that everybody's on the same page and, and is operating off of the, the same um, set of policies and practices but also that they know how to use the tools. Um, you know, so how many times have you joined a company and um, you're given access to a lot of different tools and um, devices, but you don't really know how to use them and nobody ever teaches you how to use them. Um, a lot of us have kind of gone through that, so don't do that. Um, and then finally, the, the last piece is encouraging transparency. So it takes, I, I think Meredith uh, last time, it takes like six to nine months to discover a breach. And many times that is, is because somebody clicks on a link or downloads a file coming out of a phishing message. And um, rather than feeling confident and comfortable saying something, um, they're worried that there might be repercussions, they're worried that they might be uh, punished or fired or, or something like that. So they, they tend to not say anything. Um, and so transparency is one of your best weapons. And when you're documenting that and putting that into your employee policies, you're really kind of setting the tone for what your culture is going to be and your style. So if it's um, you know, firm and clear, but also understanding that people are going to make mistakes and you're encouraging transparency and here's the process for um, who you call because many times they don't know, who should I call if there is a problem where I think I've made a mistake or I saw a message come across, do I really need to buy those gift cards? Clearly telling people who to call when they have questions and need help, even if it's you know the, the CEO or the founder of the company, um, but make it clear for people to where they can get help. I think it's interesting too, you're mentioning culture. As we go back to, if we go back to acceptable use policies, um, there's lots of canned templates out there. So if you if you search for an acceptable use policy, you'll find lots mm -hmm. of different samples out there that you can use. Um, but they really they really need to be tailored to the culture of the organization. Right. So for instance, you know some organizations um, are very you know nose to the grindstone, um, and there's no personal email, no social social media, no, none of that in our organization. Other companies um, really pride themselves on striking more of a work life balance. Um, you know, work hard, play hard kind of thing. So it's okay from a cultural perspective for folks to, you know, to take a break to go look at their Gmail for a second, um, which also comes with security risk that has to be balanced. <laughs> um, I am right. starting to see that, that more companies, um, even with the, that flexible culture, are saying, you know what, if you need to check your Facebook or your Gmail, that's what your phone is for, right? There's other tools that we have off the network, off the business network that you can use to, um, to uh, check your, on your personal things. And, and that's okay, right? It's, it's fine because, you know, work-life balance. Uh, but you really need to, you really do need to tailor those policies to the personality and the culture of your organization. Um, so, you know, I, I went through an exercise with an attorney um, when we were developing our own policy. Um, and it was, it was, I think, an hour and a half on the phone of just answering, you know, firing questions at me, answering questions, and it spat out a, a policy. Um, and that was a great starting point, but then it needs to, needs to be tailored to what our organization's culture is like. 
Yeah, I think Meredith makes a great point is you can Google and you can find or go to LegalZoom and, and find examples of policies. Um, a good place that um, I think organizations should start is, is starting with your payroll provider or your bank. Um, starting with your payroll provider, many times they already have policies like these. And so in addition to payroll services, and I'm thinking of uh, providers like Paychex, ADP, um, they have a wealth of different policies that they've helped um, their, their payroll clients um, put together and implement. Um, and usually it's free of charge. So if you already have a payroll provider, um, ask them, do you have a template that I could use? Um, and then as Mary said, tailor and tweak it. You don't wanna use a Department of Defense level uh, policy for your organization if, if you're say a retailer and you know, you're know you on Instagram and Facebook trying to um, sell your brand, sell your company, sell, sell your product. Um, two very different things. So tailor it. And then your bank. Um, getting on the same page here with your bank in terms of understanding, here's here's what we are going to do to protect us because your bank is is uh, your financial well-being. Well -being. And so in this case, um, that policy, and we touched on it um, earlier in the week, is, is voice confirmation of if there's a change to your banking information, a change to your invoicing, um, you know, it's it's good for you to be aware of that and keep an eye on that. So monitoring transactions, monitoring your bank statements. But if you talk with your banker and make sure that they are monitoring as well, and if they see anything strange or odd to pick up the phone and call you as well. Um, so that helps prevent wire fraud, uh, which is a significant amount of loss uh, in this space. So voice confirmation and picking up the phone and having that that dialogue with your bank, uh, if they see anything strange, pick up the phone and call and vice versa. Um, so in this case, you're, you're kind of aligning and you're working with people to not just see something strange, but actually pick up the phone and say something about it. Because um, it doesn't do anybody any good to say, well, I saw something a week ago, but I just kind of figured, eh, no big deal. No, in that case, technology of there's an alert but people need to take action on it uh, and pick up the phone and call is a key piece of, of making that technology actually useful in this case and doing it with your bank and having a conversation with your banker about what that's going to look like for you. Um, do that, uh, do that as soon as you possibly can uh, right after you back up. And we're seeing a lot more automated protections in the banking space. So I'm sure everyone's gotten the message from the bank that an odd charge was on their credit card. <laughs> Um, and you have to confirm the charge or not. So those kinds of protections are also coming into play in the um, wire fraud space. So uh, your bank is gonna advise you, as Matt said, to always do a voice confirmation of any changes to financial payment information. And again, that is wire transfers, but it's also payroll. So um, in one organization we worked with, the, um, the director of the organization, the president of the organization sent an email to the uh, folks who are doing payroll saying, hey, my, my bank account was compromised. I immediately need to switch my, um, my direct deposit to another routing number. Uh, it was a phishing email. The policy um, should have been to go talk to the managing director about uh, that change and get an authorization face-to-face. -face. Um, they, they didn't do that. So one pay cycle of that person went to the wrong place. So it's, it's everything, you know, down, right down to employees and payroll changes up to you know make sure you're wiring information to a routing number that's been confirmed um, with a voice call at a known good number not the number that's in the phishing email uh, to, to error is human um, but technology in order to work and to be effective requires us to typically to, to take action to put um, what the technology is telling us or suggesting that we do um, to actually do it so uh, aligning the the actions that your people and you um, as a business owner as an entrepreneur need to take um, in addition to using these tools and these service providers because you work together um, you're not just simply offloading the risk and the actions and the responsibilities um, but being clear about what those actions and responsibilities are um, so that you're on the same page uh, with your employees and also with your partners um, and your suppliers and customers Sure. 
So one other uh, option out there that we've talked about is doing self-test uh, or doing phishing test campaigns. Um, so in this case, you are sending an email to all your employees that is a, it's a phishing test. It has a link in it that if they click on it, um, you get you can see in a, in a dashboard who's, who's fallen for the scam. Um, there are a number of free tools out there. Most of them uh, cap at about 100 email addresses, which is fine for the majority of small businesses. So you can go to know before um, or uh, Matt, there are a couple other ones that you, you've used um, and, and put those campaigns together for yourself. Most of them have, have canned uh, fake phishing emails. So they might come from LastPass or um, Amazon, or we did one a couple of weeks ago for a client using Zoom. So we want everybody to be careful about their Zoom links. Um, lots of free tools out there. But you know, to, to Matt's point earlier about sticking with your with your core competencies, managing a phishing a phishing test might not be you know your first uh, your first priority in managing your business. Um, so you can um, you know you have options to use the free services, but there are also paid subscription services out there uh, that the companies will manage those campaigns for you and make sure that they're happening on a regular basis and then reporting back to you, so you can make a decision about. Um, about what you want to do with communicating with folks who might have fallen for the phishing campaign. Um, so, you know, get, having someone else manage the schedule, manage the content. Um, you know, when, when we manage a campaign for a client, we're typically coordinating with them about what the content's going to be, but then we're taking care of, um, of sending out the messages and tracking the results for them. So it takes a lot of that work off their plate. Um, so, you know, the free ones are out there. Right, so the, the financial cost is low, um, but you have to manage the campaigns. The paid services, you know, it's automated. Uh, you get some help with, with interpreting the results. Um, you'll get some help with how to manage employees. Um, the con, of course, is that, that there's a fee associated with that. Most of them aren't, aren't too terribly expensive, um, but you know, there's free and there's not free. And each of them, each of them have a different cost. Yeah, and Meredith, if I remember correctly, some of the some of the service providers here, it's a it's a couple of dollars a user a month, and so it's it's yeah. uh, you know for thirty bucks, um, you can cover a, a employee base of ten, um, and set yeah. it and forget it in many ways. And most of those paid services also include training. Um, yeah. So know before who is one of the most well known um, organizations in phishing testing, at least in the country. Um, know before has a process where if an employee uh, clicks on a, a link in a phishing email, they automatically get enrolled in training. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, it is a oh, so you you didn't you weren't able to recognize this email. Um, so let's make sure that we get you the education you need to to know why this was a mistake. Right, and part of the reason we we are focusing on the phishing aspect of this is. To our conversation on Monday, 91% of your attacks are going to come through phishing. And there may be more uh, exotic versions uh, for that remaining 9% uh, that are different, but the easiest and fastest way for um, an adversary to gain access to your systems and your information and your financials is going to be through a phishing message and a, a phishing mail or, or Facebook message or LinkedIn message. Um, so that's why we're focusing on the phishing aspect of this uh, when we're talking about testing and training. I just, just want to go back to, too, it's important that this is a, an education exercise and not a gotcha exercise. So we were actually having a conversation inside Vertical 6 about our phishing tests. And, you know, the question came up, how hard should we make this? Right, because we are a fairly technical group of users um, who are pretty savvy at identifying um, what a phishing email looks like. Uh, and you know, the team was saying, we can make this so no one, so everyone will fall for it. And I said, that's actually not the point, right? The point is to educate folks on what to look for when a real fish comes in, not just to try to trick everyone. Right. So I'll, I'll let you know how that one goes. <laughs> right. I mean, if the point is to make everybody look bad uh, and, and have the security person say, I told you so, then um, give them enough, give them enough time and they will find a way to trick everybody. Yep. Um, but that's, that kind of goes against the spirit of their real life attack is that they are trying to get you to take action right away, right now. Um, and as we pointed out on Monday, um, if you apply that kind of checklist of, you know, where, 
where did the email come from, check the email address, check the, um, the URL, the link, check the grammar, check the signature, uh, the attachments line up. If you do that, you're going to catch the vast majority, but sure, uh, if your point is to trick somebody, then you'll be able to trick them if you, if you uh, keep at it long enough. Sure. Supply chain. The supply chain. Um, and so we, we referenced this in the, uh, the headline grab uh, earlier in the presentation. And we've talked about this a little bit um, this week is that securing your supply chain is, is important. It's, it's always been um, a key part of your brand, right? So are you reliable? Can I trust you? And trustworthy businesses are going to be part of the su supply chain. Um, and a viable, robust part of those um, communities and those uh, business ecosystems. Um, and anchor companies, even here in Rhode Island, like CVS or Citizens Bank, are starting to take a harder look at the security disposition for their um, for their suppliers, for their vendors. So even if you know you're a food services company, uh, they're going to start asking you about your ability to protect yourself from a breach or an attack. And, and why is that? Well, you know, again, the headlines in terms of the target breach that came from a HVAC vendor, um, not an IT consultant, not a software engineer who's working on a contract basis. So this is, this is in a sense going to help us sort out what we've always kind of known to be true is who do I trust? Um, who is trustworthy? Who is secure? Who's reliable? And who will we continue to do business with? So there's the, the larger uh, businesses uh, as well as um, larger organizations that look, look at that. Um, but that's also just good practice for you from the standpoint of uh, reassuring your customers during these times. Uh, they're a little scary, uh, but reassuring and, and making a part of your brand that um, not just your, the companies you supply, but the companies that supply you. Um, so upstream would be an anchor like CVS or um, like the Department of Defense. We do a lot of defense work here in Rhode Island and the Department of Defense is actively assessing um, all businesses, not just big, but small providers. Um, so Raytheon and a, you know, an engineering outfit out of uh, North Kingstown, you're both going to go through a security assessment. And the initial assessments are largely done but very soon, we think within the next year to uh, by 2021, um, what was optional and what was uh, an opportunity to improve and to show improvement will become a hard and fast um, compliance period. So the grace period is winding down um, and the compliance period is, is coming. So it gets you, it's just a smart move to proactively engage with your um, supply chain, your bigger customers, as well as your bigger suppliers. Um, start with them, but really kind of cover your entire ecosystem to talk about what you're doing, um, how you're protecting your business, so that, you know, if there is something strange that they see uh, that you are talking to each other, that there is dialogue and that there's transparency. Um, so that security is a part of your brand um, for the upstream supply chain as well as the downstream supply chain. And you know, I think when we're looking at your supply chain, your downstream supply chain, um, you wanna be evaluating those companies, not just for security, <laughs> but also availability, right? So what are their disaster recovery plans and how soon can they be up and running and continuing to support your business in the event that they have some kind of a disaster, whether it be a cyber disaster or a flood or something else. Um, and then also, if you're, if you're working with partners who are processing data for you, whether it's financial data or um, personally identifiable data or, or private health information, um, you know, what are their privacy policies and those kinds of things. So it really, it does go beyond security uh, to a large degree. Uh, I think in most cases, if you're evaluating your supply chain, it, it's gonna be security and availability are the two that are key. Um, but you know, the, there's the, the other areas as well. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Meredith, because you know, in um, during the current uh, COVID pandemic, 
we're seeing supply chain challenges, right? Uh, toilet paper, <laughs> for example. Yep. Um, so, you know, you can't, you, the supply of toilet paper is limited. Um, and where is that breaking down in the supply chain? Is that Target's responsibility? Is that the supplier uh, logistics company who delivers that uh, toilet paper? Is that their responsibility? So when you're thinking about your supply chain, you can probably, you know, sit down um, in front of a whiteboard or a piece of paper and say, okay, from putting it on the shelf and selling it, um, whether digitally or in person, back to who actually makes it, who delivers it, that's your supply chain, you know, and then as you sell it, you know, that's kind of in a sense your upstream supply chain. So who are your customers? Um, how are they consuming? How are they using your products? And so you're gonna do that and you know, in the context of toilet paper, we're already doing that of where's the supply chain breaking down? Um, and supply chain security is, has always been especially important to manufacturers. You can't make a car unless you have seats, unless you have brake pads, unless you have other pieces that go into that car. And global supply chains are having some problems right now. Um, so you use that same map and that same overlay to just simply understand start asking the question of, is this, uh, are they, how are they in terms of um, cybersecurity? And so in terms of information and cybersecurity, a lot of companies have already gone through kind of supply chain um, resilience questions. Again, you know, toilet paper is just one of them. But now there's, there is a second set of questions around, uh, okay, how are they in terms of their information security? because that's a whole other set of questions um, and proactively engaging in that conversation, but using a lot of the same maps that you already use today to make sure that you're getting the supplies that you need. Well, start asking those same suppliers, hey, how secure are we? Because your customers are going to ask you. Um, so prepare for those conversations and ask your suppliers and proactively engage in those conversations with your customers so that you're on the front foot as opposed to the back foot. And there are a lot of organizations in this state, um, you know, manufacturing, we've, we've kind of touched on that. Polaris MEP, for example, um, is, is absolutely focused on manufacturing and has a whole set of training and events and knowledge around um, information security for manufacturers that have less than 10 people. So they, they know how to help you secure your business um, and you don't have to be a big business to be secure and have a reputation for security. Absolutely, Matt. Um, yeah, and as we as we look at our toilet paper problem, um, it, it might not just be supply. <laughs> There's a little, little bit of a demand issue going on there too. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> True story. Um, you know, if, if your Clorox bleach, bleach and your toilet paper are missing, um, yep. we got some problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, so I think that's a good segue to, to using partners who can keep up, um, and especially in the security and technology space. Um, you, you know, Meredith, uh, you work for Vertical Six, and you see this all the time of, of this question, um, and I referenced it earlier, where uh, a $20 million, biz $20 million in revenue a year business um, has probably outgrown a friend or friend when it comes to um, managing their rebranding exercise. Um, there's gonna reach a point where you're probably gonna outgrow the homegrown website um, that, that you created. Um, but that's, that's fine for a lot of businesses as they start and as they transition to digital. Um, but many of you will um, outgrow some of those people or some of those systems um, pretty quickly. And then there's the question of, do I really want to do this as a, as a full-time um, full job? And you kind of break that question down into should I hire or should I rent? Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm working with an architecture firm. They have 80 architects um, around the world. They don't have a, um, an IT, IT team member. Um, the COVID shutdown has, has hurt them significantly um, because they, they realized in the midst of this that their current provider was not going to, um, was not going to be the provider of the future. Um, just the limitations of their technology and their infrastructure, roughly only 15 architects can work at a time 
because the system can't handle all 80 of them working at the same time. And that's, that's a big problem um, to only have 20% um, of your productivity uh, available to you as a business. So having a technology provider and picking a technology provider who can, who can keep up um, and grow with you um, and be proactive and anticipate some of these, some of these challenges that come across. Um, Cause a good provider has, has more than likely seen a few um, scary situations, maybe not a pandemic. Uh, that's a little hard to anticipate, but certainly spikes in demand and, and challenges with reliability and issues like that. Um, they should be well versed in that. Um, Meredith, and kind of what do you see like when you're talking with potential customers? Uh, what do you talk through with them? So, so to be fair, we did not see the pandemic coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, certainly we have had conversations with our with our clients. Um, over the years about things like, um, you know, is your internet connection suitable if all of your people needed to work from home? Um, so take an accounting firm. If there's a snowstorm on April 1st, which has never happened, I'm sure, um, and nobody can get to the office, how are you going to get those tax returns done in crunch time, right? So accounting firm, people are working 16 hours a day as we get towards, towards April 15th, or this year, I guess it'll be July 1st, and there better not be a snowstorm on July 1st. Um, you know, so what do you do if there's a snowstorm on, on April 1st and your folks can't get in? So, you know, we have been talking for a while about, about internet connections and bandwidth ability um, or capabilities and the ability to support a full-time workforce at home. Um, so we have those conversations well ahead of, of hopefully the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we're also talking to our clients about, okay, you're a police force. Um, if you can't get a live answer at three o'clock in the morning, what does that mean? Um, or you're a manufacturing operation with two shifts. Is somebody available to help you out at 10 o'clock when um, your manufacturing production systems go down and your folks don't know what to make next? Um, so really, you know, your, your partner should be commensurate with your business in a number of different ways. You need to find an organization that, that knows your business or will get to know your business very well um that is available when you need them um so you know for instance vertical six we have a 24 7 help desk they are located in warwick um so there is always somebody available onshore to answer a call um you know and i think it's fair to also ask what security mechanisms are they utilizing to um, protect your data so for vertical six we don't we have backup data for some of our clients it sits in an encrypted uh SOC 2 data center but also i have access to my client systems right so what am i what am i doing to um, make sure that folks can't get into our systems to get to our client systems uh, and that's a huge focus it, it should be a huge focus for any more managed services provider but it's certainly um, something we spend a lot of time thinking about um, so you know i think there's you're looking for a partner right you're looking for somebody that you're going to trust a big uh, component of your business with um, and, and you want to make sure that's a relationship that you can have over the long over the long term. Um, you know, changing your provider is not non-disruptive um, and impacts every person in your organization. So you want to look for somebody that can be your partner, um, will really get to understand your business and how you work, and be able to advise you on industry trends in the IT industry um, and on best practices for keeping your organization healthy, up to date, and, and balanced, right? I'll, I'll come back again to balance. Um, I'm a nerd, Matt's a nerd. Uh, we, we like to, to play with new tools um, and implement new, new types of systems, but there certainly has to be a business purpose for those implementations. It's a productivity gain, um, it, it's some kind of savings, it will expand your business, uh, support your growth. You know, we need to balance those new technologies and the cost in new technologies. Um, with what the impact on the business is so you know i think my main message would be find a partner find someone that you can trust and that has the capabilities to support your business the way it needs to be supported um, you know a lot of organizations we run into they have a guy so they have someone that they call when there's a problem um, the, the issue then becomes a how is that person uh, keeping up to date with technology and trends if they're a solo practitioner and also, what happens when they go to Tahiti for vacation and they're not, they're not reachable? What are you doing in that case? So 
you know, there's usually, again, you know, it's a balance of, of cost. Um, if you have a guy, they're probably less expensive than working with a, a bigger company, uh, but you need to balance the benefits that you get from working with a bigger company uh, against that cost. Yeah, uh, I, I think, um, you know, the architecture and engineering firm that I mentioned, um, their current provider, um, you know, they needed a quote uh, to upgrade their infrastructure and it was $80,000 just to upgrade the server. And that was just kind of that tipping point. They went, whoa, um, maybe it's time for a change because $80,000 in one fell swoop versus a service um, and an ongoing service and a subscription over time, um, they reached that point where they kind of had to see a price tag. Un unfortunately, um, it was a reactive conversation um, instead of an ongoing dialogue. But I think to Meredith's point, a practice that I like to see here is, is there's the initial um, setup and that usually kind of takes three to six months to kind of get on the same page mm -hmm. and make sure you're aligned. But a regular review of how things are going. Um, so what happened in the past over the last 30 days or maybe um, if not monthly, quarterly. So what happened? What do we need to talk about? What do we need to be aware of? Um, and where do you need to go next? That's a dialogue you need to be having with your service provider, um, as well as if you have hired somebody and you have an internal IT resource, that's a conversation you need to be having on a monthly or quarterly basis with whoever is providing that IT service for you so that you don't get caught flat-footed. And we, we actually take a two-tiered approach to that. Um, so all of our managed clients are assigned an engineer and a VCIO. The engineer meets with the client on usually a monthly basis and reviews ticket logs, any trending they're seeing, that sort of stuff. You know, so if we see that Matt is calling um, every other week with an Excel problem, although Matt, I know Office is your superpower, so you wouldn't be doing that. Um, Actually, I would Excel. I'm, I'm better at PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, clearly. Um, so, you know, do, do we need to talk about, is it, a, is it a hardware problem? Is it a training problem? Or is it, is it something else? Maybe, maybe Matt needs to choose a career in IT. Um, so the, the uh, dedicated engineers are doing, are doing that. And then our VCIO team is meeting with our clients quarterly or, or twice a year, depending on the size of the business, um, to look at how, are they, how is that environment doing against our best practices and what's next. So is what's next that you, you know, it's, it's depending on the business, an $80,000 investment in servers could be low, could be high. Um, but, you know, we're, we're also looking at options like, well, should we be moving you to, into a cloud-based infrastructure? Do we want to get right. you out of CapEx um, so you're not investing in hardware? Um, or is that not a great idea? I have a client whose business manufacturing process is so heavily reliant on technology that moving them off-site to a cloud-based infrastructure is a risk, right? If our internet connections go down, they stop making things. Right. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at that balance and looking out, you know, in two years, your servers need to be repurchased. What are the right options for your business? So there's lots of conversations we're having on a regular basis. Um, we're not suggesting travelers here, but an umbrella was a good, a good image. Um, so, you know, the, the other piece for us, um, what, one of the elements that comes up on our best practices review is, do you have cyber liability insurance? Um, and at this point, pretty much every business should be looking at a cyber liability insurance package. Um, it's usually an additional policy on top of your, your general insurance policies. Um, and as we talked about before, going through this process of applying for cyber liability will actually be educational. Um, so, so maybe it's worth it to get, to get applications from a number of different companies just so you can see uh, what they're looking for. But, you know, we've seen policies they're asking about, do you have a disaster recovery plan? Are you using multi-factor authentication? Um, do you have encryption in place? So, and those are all pieces that we've talked about uh, over, the, over the last two sessions. But, you know, being able to check those boxes is going to give you a level of assurance that you're doing some of the right things. Um, you know, we worked with a client recently who um, did have a ransomware problem. Um, it was a very good thing that they had a cyber liability insurance policy. Um, it, it, when, you know, we need to be looking at how much you should have in your policy. In this case, um, 
the, the bad guys for ransomware, they're starting now in the several hundreds of thousand dollars range. Um, so, you know, that starts to add up very quickly. When you look at what's it going to cost to pay the ransom if I have to, um, what's it going to cost to negotiate? And so there's actually ransomware negotiation teams. So there's a cost to those guys. Um, your insurance company is probably going to um, retain a forensics company. So there's a cost to that. And there's a cost to the recovery, right? So do you need to get new hardware? Um, how long is it going to take to get that data back? And, and how much are you going to pay for the people, uh, the professional services to go decrypt all your data for you, restore your applications to operational functionality? Um, so those things add up very quickly, not to mention the cost of the business downtime. So um, these policies are, are very helpful if they have to be invoked to keep the business afloat. Um, so a few questions you might want to ask your insurance carriers. Uh, you certainly want to look at what the overall per incident limits are, bearing in mind some of those costs that we, we just talked about. Um, you know, if there's ransom to pay, do you have to engage third parties to help with the recovery? And then, of course, the, the downtime to the business. Um, are there exclusions or limits? So one of the ones that I've seen popping up a little bit more now are limits on, um, they may be called social engineering limits, or they might be called phishing limits. But how much will the carrier uh, reimburse you for if you make a wire transfer the wrong place? Um, and then, of course, you want to make sure that you're working with a reliable carrier uh, and broker. So you want to find, again, it's, it's a partnership. You want to find the right partner um, for your insurance, um, for your cyber liability insurance, because when, when push comes to shove, if something bad happens, you don't want them to say, oh, well, you forgot to cross the T, so we're out. Um, but it's a very important tool in your toolkit. And as I mentioned, for us, it's a, it's a best practice that we are benchmarking our clients against. Um, to be sure that they have it in the event that, in the event that there's one bad click, right? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, many times the insurance policy and the practices um, to respond to an event, the insurer will typically start to coordinate legal resources. Um, so if there's a need to engage law enforcement, um, then oftentimes they'll help coordinate some of those resources as well. Um, and that's that actually leads us to, as we close here, um, and as we come near the end, there is a robust local community here in Rhode Island around information security and cybersecurity. Um, so legally, we have the Rhode Island Cyber Joint Task Force um, that Representative Langevin runs. Um, there's the Rhode Island Fusion Center, and those are state police, um, you know, regulatory focused entities that um, can help you respond to cyber criminals and to um, incidents. We're fortunate to have those uh, locally available and, and locally robust communities. But there's also industry groups like Polaris MEP, there's Ocean, there's the Tech Collective, um, there's academic institutions, there's the Pell Center at Selva Regina, um, there's programming at URI, we have subject matter uh, experts and leaders at Roger Williams and at NEIT. Um, certainly not leaving off any other academic institutions that are local, just we're, we're giving you examples of what we know about. And then there's the communities that are being built actively by groups like Venture Cafe. So if you have questions, talk at these events and talk to the leaders at, in these organizations about things that you want to know about, that you need to know about, so that you can tap into the resources and the help that's available to you. So um, this is our last of three webinars, Matt. Um, so just to recap what we covered today, uh, we, want to, we want you to leverage your partners, so your bank, your payroll people, um, your insurance company, and your, your local resources. Um, really want you to be collaborating with folks, finding out what, other, what others of your peers are doing, um, you know, collaborate with knowledgeable resources, engage with Polaris MEP uh, if you're in manufacturing. Lots of folks out there to collaborate with, but as always, and we've ended every, every session with take a balanced approach, right? You need to be balancing what your business is, what you're trying to protect, your security with usability, right? Because every time I add uh, a security element to my organization, it's gonna take people a little more time to get into re to, uh, to access resources. Um, so it's gonna slow folks down a little bit. And then of course the cost. And we talked a lot about costs today with respect to the free tools versus the, the paid tools. 
Um, there's actually a cost to each one, right? So the free tools don't have a monetary cost. They certainly have a, a, a cost in your time. Um, and you know, the, the um, paid tools have monetary cost, but they're gonna save you a little bit of time. Um, so definitely we need balance and security. You know, if you're in the midst of a breach situation, we want you to take a deep breath before making knee jerk reactions about um, new tools that you might need because in the middle of a breach, just like, um, you know, if you've ever had, ever had a virus on your computer, what you want to do next is buy all the antivirus tools and then you're great about your antivirus until you, your awareness kind of decreases a little bit. But take a balanced approach. Don't, don't, knee -jerk, don't have knee jerk reactions um, in situations where there's risk. And then in terms of what's next, you know, for our last two sessions, our what's next was the sessions coming up. Um, but what's next now as we wrap up our third session is it's time for you to take action with your business to really evaluate what your security posture is, what kind of tools you already have in place and where might there be some gaps and then engage the resources to talk about what the right solutions are um, for your business. And as we leave you, I think we have one more message of, of uh, hope and not being alone in our to or together in our aloneness or, or vice versa. Right. And we, we appreciate you joining us this week. Uh, hopefully you have learned a lot and emerged hopeful uh, as opposed to scared or concerned. Um, sure, it's a serious topic, but start the dialogue uh, here with Venture Cafe. Um, reach out, um, comments, uh, reach out to the leadership team, to the programming team, um, as you wanna know more about these topics or want to dig in deeper. Um, you know, Meredith and I are here, uh, we're not going anywhere, but uh, there's a lot of other uh, organizations around the state that are happy to help and can help. Um, so we have a good, strong, robust community and we're proud of that. Um, the Rhode Island effect of being able to pick up the phone and get in touch with uh, one degree of separation with you know, somebody driving the, uh, the Congress's agenda on uh, cybersecurity is, is pretty cool. You can't really do that in New York City. Um, so we have some built-in advantages to, to help us um, you know, leverage what's unique about Rhode Island, um, specifically in cybersecurity. So um, everybody stay well. Thank you for your time and uh, take care. Thanks everyone.